Chopin is probably the most enduring of all composers from the 19th century because he believed that his music could speak a message that wasn't too defined. In other words, he published his pieces with rather neutral titles and the deep expressive message that the music conveys is left for all to interpret as they wish. And I think that that's one very important reason why the, the music still speaks to us today because it wasn't too pinned down in terms of communicating the meaning of a specific poem or artwork or anything. Chopin's music in that sense is more neutral, but through its neutrality it has the potential to speak to us in unique and very personalized ways. Chopin died in 1849 and right from the start a legend grew up around him. I mean he was already a popular composer during his lifetime, um, rather legendary even then because he rarely played in public but each time he did so it caused enormous sensations um, through the Paris public or beyond. Um, after he died um, a, a, a tradition grew up around Chopin playing and uh, defined in different ways and attached to different pieces which um, soon became embedded in the key and core repertoire. If one were to go to the concert hall today to hear a recital by a leading pianist, it would be surprising if Chopin didn't feature at some point in the concert program. Chopin music exists in almost innumerable different versions for a number of reasons. First of all, his imagination was ceaseless and boundless, so he continually revised his works, not necessarily to improve them, but simply because he had different ideas about how the music might go. And so, for instance, if there are multiple manuscripts of a piece by Chopin, we'll find differences of all kinds. So, for instance, we have multiple endings of some pieces, and indeed multiple endings which show a change of mind back to earlier versions. This is all part and parcel of the creative genius of the composer. At the time Chopin brought out his music, there was limited international copyright and he needed to release multiple editions in order to avoid the risk of piracy. So he brought out editions normally in Paris, London, and either Leipzig or Vienna. These were all different because the source texts that were used to prepare them all differed in sometimes in very significant ways and sometimes in minor ways. Furthermore, um, the editions were brought out in small print runs, maybe 25 to 100 copies. So when they sold out in a shop, the publisher had to produce new copies in order to sell them, and that gave the opportunity for changes to be made, sometimes at Chopin's behest and sometimes at the publisher's. The um, online Chopin Verorum edition, or OCV as we call it, attempts to pull together the different primary sources that exist for Chopin's music. And I mean by primary sources, the earliest manuscripts, such as sketches, as well as the complete manuscripts that he would give to his publishers, copies that were made of those manuscripts, also given to publishers, although different ones, as well as then the first editions, first impressions and later impressions where they have changes. So it brings together all of this material in a digital environment, available online, free of charge for anybody to see and to compare the differences as they wish, and they can then draw their own conclusions, first of all, about the creative evolution that the music underwent, but also, importantly, what versions they themselves wish to play in performance. When you go to the OCVE site, you'll find a whole index of all of the pieces of Chopin that exist in the resource. You can select, say, a given work, and then for that piece there'll be the sketches and the complete manuscripts and all of the different first editions that we've been able to draw together. You choose one, and then you can view a particular page of the source, and that in itself is very valuable and interesting. Then, because of the way we've chopped up those sources digitally, you can select a given bar, you click on the bar in question, and it loads on a different screen along with all of the other versions of the same bar in the different sources that exist within the OCVE resource. 
One of the nice features of the OCV site is that you have what amounts to a virtual notepad. You can make your own annotations on the different sources that are confronting you, um, and you can either keep those annotations to yourself or share them publicly. This is a pianino, a Playel pianino, um, which was manufactured in about 1846. We know that from the register number inside the piano. This is precisely the sort of instrument that Chopin had when he was teaching. He had an upright piano like this, a pianino, as well as a grand in the room in which he taught. And he would sit at the piano like this and demonstrate for his students. This instrument has a beautiful silvery sound as a result of the mechanism in, with which it's built. Just listen to a simple passage and you'll hear what I mean. much more of a wash around it, a chiaroscuro effect, compared to the modern Steinway, which most pianists would prefer. Let's look at the C minor prelude, Opus 28, number 20, which was completed no later than January 1839, when Chopin sent the finished manuscript to his friend Julian Fontana in Paris. He himself was on Mallorca at the time. Now, we think that the original conception of this piece was not the full 13-bar version, which was published, but in fact a shorter version, only nine bars long. There's a little note on the manuscript about a concession made to Mr. X, a music publisher who was often right, according to Chopin. Let's listen to the nine bar, possibly original version. The C minor prelude is a very controversial work. Nobody's really certain what Chopin intended in the third bar. In the manuscript, which he sent to Julian Fontana in January 1839, it ends in a major harmony in the third bar, whereas in some of the sources, including some used by Chopin himself, it ends in a minor key. This is how it sounds in the manuscript that Chopin completed by 1839. natural on top, whereas in some later sources and in one of the student copies, a copy used by his Scottish student Jane Sterling, we have E flat, which changes the colour completely. When I'm listening to the prelude in concert, I often um, try to determine which edition the pianist in question might have been using, because the French first edition and also the German first edition have the E natural, just like Chopin's manuscript, and many later editions preserve that. But we think the flat may have been correct, musicologically speaking, it sounds better, quite possibly, but both, theoretically, are possible, and perhaps Chopin wanted both at different stages in his career. One thing we have to bear in mind is that for Chopin there was no single version. He continually changed his mind, and I think that's an important and very useful model for us too. Um, we may be able to point to a single reading of a piece from a particular occasion when Chopin wrote it out in this particular way, but the next day it might have been different. And so therefore, there's no such thing, I think, at least in my opinion, as a single true version of a piece. This allows us to create our own versions, if you like. One thing that I do in the case of one of the waltzes, the F minor waltz, is to piece together Chopin's own versions. And so you have five different manuscripts that survive, plus an edition based on another manuscript now lost. I, as a pianist, piece together elements from these six and produce something that's uniquely mine, using Chopin's materials, which in essence moves away from the letter of any given Chopin source, but which captures the spirit of improvisation which characterized his own performance and his approach to composition. Towards the end of his life, Chopin had to copy out multiple versions of his manuscripts for different publishers. He no longer had a reliable amanuensis to do so. 
And as a result, we have sometimes radically different versions of the music in question. Here, for example, is the B major nocturne, Opus 62, number one. And you can see by looking at the sketches and the different manuscripts how Chopin's mind changed as he went through different possibilities. Here's a version that we have in one of the sources. As against in another source. So all sorts of different possibilities there. Which is right? Well, none is right as against the others. They're all right. They're all from Chopin. And you can make up your own mind which to choose. And in fact, you as a pianist could combine different sources, if you wish, in a way that an editor never really could. Another example where Chopin changed his mind several times is in the F major A minor ballad, Opus 38, where he had an ending, changed his mind to another one, and then went back and forth. And in the manuscript that was used by the French publisher Trutna, and we have one of the versions actually crossed out very liberally with another one taking its place. So here's the version that's crossed out, somewhat grander. As against the simpler version that survived. Quite a modest ending, particularly given the furore that has taken place just minutes before in this very large-scale and exciting piece. Chopin lends himself very, very well indeed to the digital environment because of the different versions that existed. It's almost impossible, in fact in many cases it is impossible, to capture on the printed page all of the different versions that he produced or that others produced of particular works. And because of the digital platform you can compare different layers and levels and see for yourself how the changes are manifested and how they, they unfolded over time. So the digital environment provides an ideal way in which to understand music as an evolving creative force rather than as something that's fixed and static. Chopin is not only a, um, an excellent example of this, but the project that we're engaged in is something of a pioneer. I mean, in this respect, there's no other composer who is being treated in precisely this way. So we look at the OCV site in itself as an important contribution to the way in which a digital edition of a composer's music might be manifested, but also potentially as a model for other such editions in the future. We have to remember that music does not exist in one and only one single right version. It changes continually over time. Chopin is a very good reminder of that to us because he himself kept changing his music. But each time we perform it, each time we edit it, each time we even listen to it, it's different from previous incarnations. So the digital environment allows us to, to model that, to capture it and to engage in the process of of change over time. In short, through the dynamic edition that we're creating, each user has the potential to create a unique version for him or herself of a particular work. We think this is an exciting possibility and it reflects what's always been understood deep at heart among music lovers and musicians themselves, but which hasn't necessarily been recognized by scholarly communities to the extent that we might have wished. Thank you.